Yes, I will. Um, Giselle Carson, um, which a lot of people already know. <laughs> um, she is a recognized business immigration and compliance attorney in Jacksonville. Um, she partners with employers to help them hire and retain global talent and develop effective immigration strategies, strategies to remain competitive and compliant in our global economy. And a little background on Giselle. She has gone through the immigration process twice. Um, she was born in Cuba and immigrated to Canada when she was a teenager with her parents. She attended and graduated um, from McGill University in Montreal, where she had to learn French um, while living there, um, with a degree in physical therapy. And then later she immigrated to the United States with her husband, Jeff. Um, she worked as a physical therapist um, for a number of years and then decided she wanted to be an immigration lawyer. So she attended Florida Coastal School of Law and obtained her Juris Doctorate degree in 2001. Um, she is now a shareholder at Marks Gray, um, so she's my partner, um, where she started a business immigration practice from scratch. Marks Gray did not have any immigration lawyers. She did it all from the beginning herself. Um, she now uses her personal experience, having gone through immigration twice, and her professional experience to help employers um, and foreign nationals um, by helping them navigate the complexities of immigration law. Um, and that includes um, obtaining work visas, um, permanent residence status, which is a green card, and naturalization status. Um, she also guides organizations on immigration compliance including um, the Form I-9 and going through a government audit. Um, she's published um, a book um, and she's uh, called the uh, Beyond the H-1B, A Guide to Work Visa Options for Employers, Foreign Nationals and Graduating Students. Um, she frequently speaks um, throughout the country on immigration matters. Um, and she is married to Jeff, who is a physical therapist. They are both accomplished Ironman triathletes and marathoners, and she is fluent in Spanish, French, and English. So welcome, um, Giselle, um, and please speak in English, because we don't speak those other languages. <laughs> Thank you, Crystal, and yeah, I, 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 when people ask me or they mention the triathlon and triath the trilingual, uh, when you speak three, you kind of lose a little bit of all of them. So uh, by now, sometimes when I was talking to my mom, even yesterday, I was like, hmm, how do you say that in Spanish? I just couldn't remember. Uh, so it's, it's interesting. So I apologize uh, from the beginning if I you know, if there is a word that doesn't come through right away in English, it may come in Spanish or French at some point. But um, thank you for having me. I, it's, it's, it's been a treat just to be here from the beginning and, and truly say hello in the chat to so many people or, or on video. There is so many people that I, that I know from your Rotary, uh, from the community, it's, it's, and, and that I haven't seen in many, many years. So. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, I also special thanks to Tom and to Gabby, who's somewhere in the background, Patty, um, and who's, you know, have helped facilitate this, and Biggins, who I also talked to at some point back when um, in, in, in an immigration case that I had going on. And so it's made it all the way around to being here. Um, and as Steve was talking, Steve Madden, who, who talked a little bit before um, at the beginning, and, and I wrote out that he mentioned, you know, stressed out clients, um, and that is part of what I'm going to be talking about, um, the, the immigration uh, on its own. It's stressful, just imagine, and actually I had sent a little note to Julia, as, as, as you were speaking on the background, I was kind of making notes of things that I, things that I could 
uh, use or, or people that I could call on to participate. And Julia, somebody had mentioned that she was moving. Um, and I was like, huh, I need someone that has been moving and I, to, to kind of share the, the perspective of just moving in the United States. Um, and then, you know, take that another level, moving from abroad into the United States, and then add to that COVID, and add to that immigration suspensions, add to that travel bans. Um, okay. It's been an interesting journey. So what I'm going to try to do, the presentation is it's long, but I'm just going to do a, a very short portion of it um, so that you get it, just so that you get a feel for what a journey, what, what is the journey about. So I don't know if Patty or Gabby have that presentation, like they can bring it up. Okay, so here we go. And the other thing that I want to say, this is for you. Um, as I was at the beginning, I was uh, talking to Tom um, and, and I said to, you know, to, this, is, this is your presentation. I want you to come out of, out of this 20 minute talk uh, with a better understanding of, of what, is, what it takes to immigrate to the United States. Um, and I, I, I want you to participate. So go ahead and ask me questions from the chat, raise your hands or unmute yourself. This is for you, okay? So we'll talk, again, the, the general idea is how, how COVID and all of these changes that we've gone through has affected immigration and, and global economies. Next slide. So in immigration particularly, so with everybody is dealing with a lot of stress and anxiety, and I want to describe the immigration as massive uncertainties. Um, and that is what we're going to talk about. And I'm just going to be talking about the immigration from abroad into the United States. Next. And one of the ways that we have been dealing with uncertainties, so, and, and I think it was Vicky Lean before said, you know, we have gained weight, lost weight, changed, all of us I know, we have changed the way we do things in some way or another. Um, and it's, it's extremely important for, for us, our team, um, to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of others. Um, and this slide, this is my team. So there is Gabby who's helping me with this presentation right now. And again, thank you because I couldn't be doing this without her. Um, Ellen and Tyra are my immigration specialist and myself. And, and we all have taken on a little bit extra, um, extracurricular things to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves so that we can best give to our clients. So how about you guys? What have you been doing? So this is your opportunity to participate. So poll time. What have you been doing to cope with the current uncertainties? Watching more movies, spending more time with fairy friends, which by the way, I have also been doing. Walking and meditating, eating and drinking a little more. Go ahead, this is your time. It's all anonymous. I want to see those fingers. <laughs> I'll give you a minute or so. I think Gabby can see the results. I can't see it from my end. Gabby, are we ready to show? Oh, this is pretty even. Wow. Typically, I get like huge you know something more than other but okay watching movies 23 spending time with furry fur friends 16 walking and meditating 29 eating and drinking more 32 okay so vicky lean i think you'll have some some donations for that uh for that uh clothing drive <laughs> thank you for participating and i have a few more like this so you also get to see from you hopefully you'll learn a little more from your own group through this presentation. All right, next. All right, so here is the main thing that we're going to talk about. Um, immigration from abroad. So this is the journey of a CEO. Um, this is the CEO of a um, food company. They, they export um, 
seafood primarily from South Africa to the United States and to many other countries around the world. And their headquarters are in South Africa and there, and he is expanding into the United States. We started working with him last year before COVID, before the, the suspensions. Um, and we, the plan uh, was to file at the beginning of the year so that he would come into the United States in February. Um, so January, we just had the final strategic call to kind of decide, you know, where, where do we go from here? How do, how are we going to, you know, how are we going to file? What is required? Once the case is approved, what is going to happen? Um, and, and I actually, so does anyone know, and again, this is another opportunity for you and you can use the chat. Um, if someone is coming from abroad into the United States because they have a company that they're forming here or they're moving to work at a company in the United States, what, what, does, what is that visa? Does anyone know? <laughs> Thank you, Dinkins. <laughs> So an L1, I appreciate that. So do you want to just come online and just say a few words about it? I can tell you it's one of a couple of different visas that uh, people can get. I think the other one's a e, uh, E1 visa um, oh. for employers, yeah. employees, um, but I don't know that much about it. I'm hoping you'll tell us more about it. That's awesome. Thank you so much. So yeah, actually, I, I wasn't even thinking E2 at this point. My brain was focused on the L, so thank you. Yes, okay. So the L1s are intercompany transferees. So it's, some, it's someone that has a company abroad that is related to a company in the United States and they can transfer. The other one, like Jenkins mentioned, is an E2. So it's a visa you have to come to the United States, you don't need a relationship between the two companies, but you're coming into the United States to actually build a company. You're investing at a minimum $100,000 and you're gonna create jobs for US workers. Those are part of the requirements of that, that E2 visa. This particular one was an L1. Um, so companies on both sides of the ocean and relationships between the two companies, perfect. All right. Uh, Julia, I'm going to call on you for a second and just just tell me, uh, just share with us uh, just two or three things. I mean, you also immigrated from abroad into the United States and now you moved here. So just share some of the things that, you know, challenges that you had and how you've overcome them. Some, I mean, obviously it's, it's different. I was a lot younger when I moved uh, from abroad, but just the culture, you know, the culture shock, the uh, kind of assimilation of, of the different customs and things. One of the biggest memories that I have when I first moved here was Walmart, <laughs> was the amount of choices that uh, we have here. Like in, in Ukraine, you know, you go to the store, there's like a red lipstick and a brownish lipstick, and those are your choices. Here, there's like 20,000 of those. So, so just on, a, uh, on that scale, you know, just, oh my gosh, I can't make a decision. So, so that, that's probably the biggest challenge back then when I was young. But uh, now, I mean, the, the moving, you know, uprooting family and changing, you know, routines, adjusting, all of that is, you know, hugely challenging to anybody. But um, coming from abroad, there's a kind of a different layer that gets added onto that. It's so interesting that you mentioned that. I mean, I've, I've, I left Cuba in 1983, so it's been a very long time. My husband keeps on reminding me that now I'm more American than I am Cuban. Um, it took a while to get there. And, uh, you know, speaking about the changes that we go through when, when you know, we have changes in our lives. Um, Julia, I can relate to you the first time that I, well, not the first time, probably first month that I started going to a supermarket and this was in Canada and Montreal. Um, and, and if some of you know of Montreal, Steinberg, Steinberg is kind of the equivalent of Publix in, in, in the United States. 
And oh my goodness, I, I, my mom could not take me out of there because I was just like, you know, like a little kid in, in the candy shop. It, I was just, I just kept on going through all the aisles and I just wanted to buy it all. And of course we had no money to buy anything. Uh, so it was more like, okay, you can look, but you cannot have it. <laughs> it was kind of sad. But, um, but yeah, those, those are some of the things that we take for granted once we're here. And, and just you mentioned it kind of revived my memories. Like, oh my goodness, that is so true. And now I kind of try to stay on the periphery of the supermarket. Rather, I have no idea what's in the middle. I, I try to avoid it. So thank you for sharing that. So for my clients, whoop, back, Gabby. This was what the package looked like, and we'll get there. Um, for my clients, uh, they, so he is himself, his wife, and two, he has two kids. Um, and they're in their, I want to say 13, 15 off the top of my head. So they are actually also in the process of all of this, trying to go to school in the United States and, and, in, in a different kind of visas. So after, so generally we had the call, we were ready to go in February. Of course, February comes and it's the first COVID related travel restriction. So we had to re-strategize um, whether they could and could not come into the United States. Uh, there were delays in communication. There were delays in obtaining documents. And then comes March where many of you, how many of you re remember the news in March that basically it was a tweet, I believe on a, I want to say it was in a Friday afternoon or a Friday evening that basically said something like immigration is suspended. Immigration to the United States is being suspended. That is all we knew at the time. Tom, thank you. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was pretty scary because at that point I was getting emails from clients saying, what does that mean to me? And I was like, I have no idea. And it's a pretty bad, and I mean, I'm, there's many attorneys and judges on the call today, which I appreciate. Thank you for being here. Um, and you know, I see my job as, or as being able to provide guidance and advice to clients and somehow I know I don't have all the answers, but I, I should have, you know, some ideas to how to guide the clients. And I had no, I, I was getting calls and emails and I was like, I don't know anything more than something about immigration is going to be suspended. Um, at that point, it was just routine services. So really it, it didn't necessarily affect them. But they are still, so this is again, someone that is having to pack their clothes, pack their home stuff, pack their kids, process their, their immigrant visas or non-immigrant visas for their, for their kids. And they're kind of stuck in this limbo of, I don't know what is gonna happen. At this point, I still had not been able to file their L1 petition. And then on March also, uh, USCIS suspended something that is called premium processing services. Does anyone know what that means? What, what premium processing does? On the chat. <laughs> and somebody, Jay, thank you for sharing that. Okay, so I'm going to be read. I don't know if all of you are paying attention to the chat. But I just, this is kind of cool. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I'm having flashbacks to being calling on in law school to the lawyers. I hope she doesn't ask me about Panoy or VNAF. Maybe I will ask her what that means. <laughs> but I was kind of in the state, you know, I don't know what I'm going to say to this client. And then Dinkin says uh, premium processing, it is expensive. Yes, it is. <laughs> so that goes with the premium. Um, so what it, it is expensive. And but but if if you can use it, it really can save you a lot of time uh, and stress. So what premium processing does is you pay the government an extra $1,500 so that they take your case out of the line in a way and they put it in a, in, in a fast track. So what, would it, what 
if I had premium processing, they would have paid, and that was a plan, to pay to get their case on an expedited processing so that it would be, they would have a response within 15 days. That response could have been, give us more evidence, but at least we would know where we stood. But that was taken away. So what happened is now, instead of an answer of some sort in 15 days, the processing times for L petitions was six months. So they were in limbo now for six months before we could do anything. So that was huge. Again, just, just think of some of you that are trying to move. If you, know, if you don't know if your electricity is going to be on for six months, if you don't know if your kids are going to be able to go to school for six months, this is everything that was happening to them. So now premium processing is taken away. And then we got another in, in April, we get a for an, another proclamation ban on new immigrant visas. So this were green cards. So I was like, okay, you're still good. It's not affecting you because you're not coming to get a green card. You're just coming to work. You're, you're just coming temporarily. Then in June, we get a second proclamation saying, now you're banned. You can, you're, if you're a new, an, an immigrant coming to the United States to work, you're not coming in. Now the people that were in the United States were okay. So if you're here and you had an H1B, an E, an L, an O, you're, you're good. It's, it's anyone coming from abroad that had a problem. Then July, do you remember that the news, some of you ban on international students? That this foreign students, and, and to this day, um, if, the, the U.S. universities are a huge magnet for international students. They, they, they drive a significant amount of revenue from international students that are truly coming to, to, to go to the best schools in the world. Um, and those students were barred from coming in. So here we have the two daughters that were planning on coming into the United States on, on their student visas that now cannot come. So just think of yourselves. if you know, going through this timeline, and this is one client out of 25, 30 clients that we're all kind of on this timeline for us. I tell you the yoga classes were very, were essential for me. And, and, and they have been, the yogas, the walks, uh, they have it, to, to keep my peace of mind and, and the ability to, to process what we have going on. And then August, finally, Premium processing returned. We were able to file. We were able to file his L1 petition. It was approved. By then, I have a CEO of a company that has been abroad since January that has business going on in the United States and has not been able to come to the United States. So in August, when his, when his petition got approved, um, he said, Giselle, this is great, but I have to have to come to the United States. Um, there's businesses and things that meetings that I have to truly go in in person. Um, so I'm going to come into the United States, which was risky, um, and then go back to consular process and get my L visa. And literally just before this, this call, and he is in the United States right now, um, and, and now we're planning on processing his green card. And so, and, and literally this, this just came in at noon. Um, I have started the process for the DS-160, which is the application for, for a visa for him. Call from wireless caller. Somebody's, somebody's call. Okay, we got it. All right, so here's what he's saying to us. I have started the process and we'll have this completed over the weekend. I'm right around here. I think he's upstairs, but Whoops. Uh, I'm on TV here right now. Okay, all right, get home. Okay. Hey, Larry, mute yourself. All right, here we go. <laughs> Sorry, Giselle, as you were. That's, that's okay. Hey, this is it's so good. So let me finish my little email from, from our client. 
I've started the process and we'll have this completed. So he, now he has a, a new visa, the visa application for his passport. I will have this completed over the weekend for you to check before I fly out on Tuesday evening. I have to spend a few days in Dubai as there is no flight to his home country until the 3rd. I will get out of the mandatory quarantine because now, because he's been in the United States and he's going back, he's going to be on a 14-day quarantine. I will come out of the quarantine October 18th, and I'm hopeful that I can schedule my counselor interview sometime before the end of October, and then I will fly, fly back into the United States on my L visa. So that's the journey for a CEO of a company that is coming to the United States. And again, this is just a sample of, of what, what many foreign nationals are, are, have gone through over the last few months as a result of, of the many things that we are all facing. Again, added the added challenge of, of being an immigrant. And Gabby, the next slide. So this is the size of the package. Um, that went out to USCIS uh, to basically show, again, the relationship between the company abroad, the company in the United States, the, his role abroad, the role that he was going to have in the United States, um, and all the other documents that are re relating to, to visa processing. And then Kim's asking me at the beginning, when we were kind of chatting at the beginning, if I did any virtual depositions. And, my work is primarily transactional. So this is it, this is my work right there. Um, our team um, works with employers and managers and executives and um, to HR professionals to gather the documents and the evidence that is required to show that someone is qualified uh, for a work visa or a green card or naturalization in the United States. As the years have passed, the, and particularly um, over the last few months, um, it, again, it's, it's become a lot more uh, complex. And the, the, the evidence, even with the size of this package, I wasn't necessarily sure if this was gonna be enough or if, and we were gonna have to go back and get more evidence uh, from, from the client. Um, let me see, Gabby next. All right, let's see another poll for you guys. All right, go ahead. How long does it typically take for a foreign student? So I, I've said at the beginning, you know, a lot, of, um, a lot of our universities, a lot of students come to the United States to study here. And many of them remain in the United States. They're, they're young, typically teenagers or, you know, early 20s. Uh, many of them come with a bachelor's degree and then go on to, they come to the United States truly for their master's, master's degree in architecture and engineering, computer and science, uh, you name it. So for one of those students, how long does it typically take for a foreign student who enters the United States to obtain a college degree to become a naturalized citizen? And I, I want to tell you, so many, often the media and others, get naturalization confused with green card or legal permanent residency. So before you apply for naturalization, you have to be a legal permanent resident or have a green card. So here in this question, I'm asking you, how long do you think it will take for someone that comes in to study in the United States to go through the process to become a green card holder and then become naturalized? All right, I'm going to see those fingers going. <laughs> Let's see what the poll says. All right, Gabby. Oh, this is not bad. Okay, so three years. Not a, no. So and I'll go through this. Twenty. All right, you guys are the smart. You figure that the the ends of the spectrum were probably not going to be necessarily the right answer. So you kind of aim for the middle, which is correct. <laughs> And truly, it could take, and, and the, the right answer is, is 15 years. It could be 10. Um, but uh, so they come as a student, and let's say at a minimum, they're here for two years doing their master's degree. Some of them are here for four doing their bachelor's degree. But let's say we take a master's. So with master's two years, 
after they finish their master's, they get at least one year of employment, um, and sometimes three, depending on what degree they're going for. But let's say that I, I'm taking an engineer, U.S. master's degree in engineering, then one year of employment worth three. Then they go into something, a, a work visa, which I do many of them, H-1Bs. And actually, I think Crystal mentioned, uh, and Duncan has seen a copy of this. Um, this is the book that I wrote. This, I'm so passionate about all of this. So the H-1B visa is the workhorse of, 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 of employment uh, visas. U.S. employment visa. So three years of a student, potentially five years on an H-1B, and then they go into the green card process, and they have to be a green card holder for at least five years before they apply for naturalization. So in general, we're kind of looking already into 10 to 15 years or more, depending on when they decide to apply. So it's a very long process. So when you hear, you know, foreign nationals or students that are coming and, you know, they're going to become a U.S. citizen in the next few years, that's, that's not reality, not right now anyway. Um, and not with, with the law, it, it, it takes a very long time. Next. I think I'm going to skip through, because the next slide, so what I did is I did kind of similarly a journey through someone for example that is coming on h1b and what we had to go through to get there so i'm going to skip that let's do another poll in january do you find the perfect candidate for a job opening the candidate accepts but needs an h1b work visa what is the soonest that you can employ this candidate in h1b status from january what do you think Three months, 10 months, one year, one month. Okay, Gabby, results. Still got a couple of people coming in. Oh, okay, sorry, yeah. Okay, now we're good. Awesome. Three months, 10 months. Okay, you guys are going for the medals. <laughs> okay, so the answer is 10. Um, so again, just think of someone that you find, and I get this, this is a typical scenario. I have a, a, an employer that finds the perfect ideal candidate. Everybody likes this person, they work hard, they have the right credentials, everybody likes them. The only problem is when they get to the, okay, let's get you employed. It's like, oops, I don't have a work visa. And they, then they reach out to me as to what can we do? Um, and, you know, it, either an H1B or a work visa. So it, 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 it can take a while. And I'm constantly saying to clients, it is, it's, it, you have, to, it's a process that takes time. Um, let me move to the next slide. So I'm going to move to the next slide fairly quickly. Um, employment verification, I'm not going to go through here. This is something else that we help employers with. Um, I'm going to skip this poll that deals with employment authorization. And then what I'm, go I'm going to stop here. Actually, this one and probably one more slide. Um, I'm hopeful that you enjoy this. If, if you have questions, a question or two that you want me to answer, please put it in the chat. Again, I, this is for you. Um, I want you to leave kind of saying, oh my gosh, I just learned something. And oh my gosh, if I need to know someone that needs immigration, business immigration, I know who to, who to call. But um, some of you know me from the community, from the legal uh, world. We have put together a, a little, an ebook. Um, on resources on COVID, um, legal resources on COVID. So if you would like a copy of that, just reach out to me, either at Mark Gray, you can email me or link with me on LinkedIn and I will send you a copy of this. Um, it's a pretty, it's, it's easy read, but it has a lot of little good tips um, on, you know, that, that employers can use um, dealing with COVID. Um, and next. As we're here today, I also want you to think, you know, what, what, what would you be do, doing different next time this year? 
uh, how our lives will be different in, in immigration and from the immigration perspective, globally, personally, hopefully my hope is that next slide, because I'm going to end with that one, that we are stronger. Uh, we accept uh, our diversity and embrace our diversity because I do believe that that is what makes us stronger. I value every one of those girls on my team, ladies in my team. Um, it is because of the difference of thoughts, experiences, and ideas that we're stronger. Um, and, and also that's what make you as strong too. I mean, as I've looked at your faces and diversity of, of, of your membership is, is how we, how we become better as a person and as a community and as an organization. So thank you so much for having me and please reach out to me. Um, I'm here to help and hope to continue to be connected with you in person, virtually or on LinkedIn. Thanks. Thank you very much, Giselle. That was very well done. Thank you. Uh, and I don't, I don't see any questions on chat right now, but perhaps you might have time to hang around for a minute or two in case suddenly something, something comes to someone. Uh, and I, I would uh, also like to let you know that we'll be making a contribution in your honor to the Rotary Foundation to end polio as thanks for your presentation today. So thank, thank, you. thank you very much.